the enemies of this people will never get weary of their persecution against the church until they are overcome. TPJS P. 259. This prophecy indicated that one or the other would have to be overcome before persecution stopped. But it didn't say which. The prophet also warned the saints about positions of church leadership. You will gather many people into the fastness of the Rocky Mountains as a center for the gathering of the people and you will be faithful because you have been true, and many of those who come in under your ministry because of their much learning, they will seek for high positions and they will be set up and raise themselves to eminence above, but you will walk in the low places unnoticed. And you will know of all that transpired in their midst and these that are your friends will be my friends. Our Pioneer Heritage, 6, 358-9. Kartner records, at another time prior to the death of the prophet he indicated that some aspirants would gain leadership positions. 171. The government will not receive you with the laws that God designed you to live, and those who are desirous to live the laws of God will have to go south. You will live to see men arise in power in the church who will seek to put down your friends and the friends of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Many will be hoisted because of their money and the worldly learning which they seem to be in possession of and many who are the true followers of our Lord and Savior will be cast down. Joseph Smith, Mosier Hancock Journal, p. 19. There were a few unyielding saints who refused to relinquish the doctrines revealed to the prophet Joseph Smith. Because these tenacious souls would not compromise, they continued to suffer. The Mormon monogamists turned against the Mormon polygamists. Previously the polygamists would not allow monogamists into the leading positions of the church. See page 95 of this publication. Now the monogamists would not allow the polygamists into leadership positions. The once exalting principle of plural marriage was now condemned as a heinous sin. The law of exaltation was reverted to a crime worthy of excommunication. Men once lived plural marriage to be worthy of leadership positions. Now they were thrown out because of it. Satan is constantly seeking to deceive men and lead them to call sin righteousness and righteousness sin. How successful has been his work? How often censure and reproach are cast upon God's faithful servants because they will stand fearlessly in defense of the truth. Men who are but agents of Satan are praised and flattered and even looked upon as martyrs, while those who should be respected and sustained for their fidelity to God are left to stand alone under suspicion and distrust. The Great Controversy, p. 221, Apostle John W. Taylor set a new precedent for the true believers. In 1906 he and Matthias Cowley were selected to be dropped from the Quorum of Twelve. It was a political expediency to appease the government's antagonism against polygamists. According to Cowley's journal, they were honorably called to this mission of resignation to satisfy government pressure. After things cooled down, they were told they would be reinstated into the quorum again. But the monogamists soon regarded their mission as a transgression, and by 1911 Apostle John W. Taylor was excommunicated from the church for living plural marriage. 172 This was a period of transition for the church. A revision of both church doctrine and policy occurred. Old doctrines were considered false and the new programs were hailed as revelations. Revisions and reversions were made. Sin and transgression should be the only grounds for excommunication. But now the spiritual tables were turned. People were being excommunicated for obeying the laws of God. Bishop Heber Benyon wrote, When men are cut off the church for wickedness, they become reprobate and go from bad to worse, but when cut off without good cause the Lord will not forsake them. Nothing but our own sins can cut us off or come between us and the Lord. The priesthood has no power in unrighteousness. Gospel Problems, P.45 Many of the men who bore the priesthood began to oppose the laws of the priesthood. These men in leadership positions had previously made covenants to defend God's laws with their lives and dash but were now rejecting those laws. Thus came a transition of church doctrine and dash and the transition of authority. For where the laws of the priesthood are not, neither will there be the keys of priesthood. The principles, doctrines and covenants of God were forced to retreat into the underground. Conditions became much the same as they were in the days of the prophet Joseph. 
If the majority of the church members will not live the gospel, then God will seek others who will. Simply because men receive or give endowments does not prove they will remain faithful to them. President Brigham Young said, Giving endowments to a great many proves their overthrow, through revealing things to them which they cannot keep. J.D. 4, 372, and have the seek and bladded. We receive the priesthood and power and authority. If we make a bad use of that priesthood, do you not see that the day will come when God will reckon with us, and he will take it from us and give it to those who will make better use of it? J.D. 6, 125. Priesthood authority was given to administer ordinances, put in the hands of worldly men it is used to change the ordinances. Daniel said they think their priesthood 173 gives them right and power to change times and laws. Dan 7, 25 When one worldly innovation is made, then it becomes easier to justify another. As one error creeps in, it invites others, until a multitude of fabrications replace the truth. The result is spiritual paralysis. The scriptures were written to be used as a guide and dash thus helping men avoid error. They will easily expose world-loving church men from the true disciples of Jesus. They are a yardstick to judge the words of men or devils. The first cardinal sin of religious leaders is to trust each other rather than the scriptures. Worldly wisdom and human learning usually always replace the word of God and dash thus the blind lead the blind. But there is another even more serious sin and dash not believing in the revelations of God. Prez. Brigham Young told the people that if they would not believe the revelations that God had given he would suffer the devil to give revelations that they and dash priests and people and dash would follow after. Have I seen this fulfilled? I have. I told the people that as true as God lived, if they would not have truth they would have error sent unto them, and they would believe it. Des. News, June 18, 1875. Deception is a replacement for truth. Those who reject God's revelations will be controlled by the revelations of the devil. Thus, many reject the truth to gain the favor of the world, but in so doing they lose favor with God. The truth is no more desired by the majority today than it was by the papists who opposed Luther. There is the same disposition to accept the theories and traditions of men instead of the word of God as in former ages. Those who present the truth for this time should not expect to be received with greater favor than were earlier reformers. The great controversy between truth and error, between Christ and Satan, is to increase in intensity to the close of this world's history. And on the other hand our Lord declared plainly, Woe unto you, when all men shall speak well of 174 you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. The spirit of the world is no more in harmony with the spirit of Christ today than in earlier times, and those who preach the word of God in its purity will be received with no greater favor now than then. The forms of opposition to the truth may change, the enmity may be less open because it is more subtle, but the same antagonism still exists and will be manifested to the end of time. The Great Controversy, Ellen G. White, p. 165. It is remarkable to note the transformation of church policy within one century. Consider a few of these reversals. Once the saints were willing to burn their homes and orchards and seek hiding places in the mountains rather than submit to government tyranny. Now they will sacrifice any principle, doctrine or ordinance to comply with any law of the land. President Wilford Woodruff once said, this government is steeped in sin and ripened for the damnation of hell. Now, Mormonism believes it a religious duty to honor and obey and be subservient to a government which has become much worse. Formerly the government passed bills and laws against the doctrines and teachings of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. Today there are many Mormon lawyers who have proposed similar bills and laws. Mormons made obedience to some principles of felony in Utah. Ministers of the abominable churches have used arguments, references, and quotations against the doctrines of early Mormonism. Now the leading Mormon theologians and professors of religion using the same materials against these early Mormon doctrines. Leaders of the church once pounded the pulpit and proclaimed that everyone but polygamists would be damned. Now the leaders pound the pulpit and shout damnation for the polygamists. 
The government wants deputized informers, sneaks, and snoops to spy out information to be used against believers in Mormonism. Now the church leaders deputize bishoprics, stake presidencies, and any other members to gather license plate numbers, names and witnesses that can be used against the believers of early church doctrine. 175 F. The early antagonists of Mormonism spewed out their venom against polygamy by calling it evil, an abomination, and adultery, in newspapers, such as the Warsaw Signal, the Novo Expositor, and the Salt Lake Tribune. Now the Deseret News says the same thing. Plural marriage was once a doctrinal law of God and his church. Now it is classed as a sin next to murder. Joseph, Hiram, and many others died for living it. Now the leaders would rather die than live it. Today many leading authorities of the church say they are speaking for God, but they teach the ways of the world. They wear the garment of the priesthood or some unreasonable facsimile, but they oppose the laws of the priesthood. They claim their words are infallible, while they change the infallible words of God. Many preside in spiritual calling, but they lack any spiritual gifts. Instead of going out into the world, proclaiming the gospel to the nations and gathering Israel to the mountains, they stay in the mountains tending business enterprises, and tell the saints to stay scattered in the world. How can all of these rejections of God's revelations be called the way of the Master? Oh, consistency. When Luther was asked why he spoke so harshly against the papacy, he replied, it takes strong medicine to cure a strong sickness. Mormonism today needs strong medicine. Evidence stands to confirm that there is a difference in the gospel of today from that which was restored to the prophet Joseph Smith. But there is not only a difference in doctrines, but also in societies they produce. A hundred years ago many towns in Utah had only one man as a policeman named Dash and even he would spend his time at farming. The problems of crime were almost nil. Mormon society was industrious, morally clean, and religiously faithful. But what have been the results over the past 100 years since we have made all the compromises, revisions, and substitutions? The results show that crime in Salt Lake City is comparable to that of any other city in the United States. Divorce has nearly equaled that of the world. Corruption, dope, whoredom and speculation have become our major problems. LDS youth are being lost to worldly standards. Our people are being shifted all over Babylon and being taught that God wants their families scattered. Our hospitals, mental institutions and prisons are being overcrowded, while 70% of church members are inactive. 176 How many broken homes and broken hearts would now prefer to go back a hundred years and live among those faithful saints of yesterday? They would like to avoid the massive spiritual pitfalls and sinful mire that surround our people today. Many are discouraged with this multitude of doctrinal changes in the church because it has made us one with Babylon. But we cannot turn back the pages of a century. Nevertheless, we can teach again those principles that made that society what it was. As discouraging as the spiritual progress of Mormonism has been, there was one bright spot. It occurred in September of 1856. This was the beginning of the Mormon Reformation. Everyone in the church was rebaptized and covenanted to reform their lives to the gospel as it had been revealed. Church historian B. H. Roberts commented on this by saying, the Reformation was doubtless a much needed moral and spiritual awakening. CHC 4, 119. This Reformation occurred only months before Johnson's army came to Utah. The saints at that time displayed courage, wisdom and faithfulness such as they had never done before or after. We need that same determination today. We need another Reformation. There must be a reformation. There will be a reformation among this people, for God will not cast off this kingdom and this people, but he will plead with the stronger ones of Zion, he will plead with this people, he will plead with those in high places, he will plead with the priesthood of this church, until Zion shall become clean before him. I do not know but that it would be an utter impossibility to commence and carry out some principles pertaining to Zion right in the midst of this people. They have strayed so far that to get a people who would conform to heavenly laws it may be needful to lead some from the midst of this people and commence anew somewhere in the regions round about in these mountains. Orson Pratt, J.D. 15, 360
Everyone in the church today should be filled with that faith and spirit of reforming their lives to obey the gospel as the Lord gave it. If leaders refuse to reform, then the members should follow the course prescribed by prayers. Brigham Young. 177. I want you to have faith enough concerning myself and my counselors for the Lord to remove us out of the way, if we do not magnify our calling, and put men in our places that will do right. J.D. 9. 142. But too often modern Mormons are shocked at any intimation that all is not well in Zion. They will protest any thought of a power or influence other than God's in leadership positions. But there is a reason and a purpose why God will allow deceptions to infiltrate into every organization. The scriptures say that. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth. To these. 2, 11-12. So, all those honorable saints who have put their trust in the arm of flesh, thus being deceived, shall be welcomed into the terrestrial kingdom. D. Ampersand C. 76, 75-79. The gates of the celestial kingdom are not reached by a mass exodus of people blindly following someone they have hailed as a prophet. Salvation and eternal life are the rewards of individual accomplishment. Therefore, let every man stand or fall, by himself, and not for another, or not trusting another. Insp. Vers. Mark 9.44 Everyone shall be rewarded according to his own faith and works. And there are still a few valiant uncompromising men filled with enough integrity to keep alive the holy principles of the gospel. They will not follow any new prophet if it means rejection of Joseph's revelations. To these men shall fall the honor and responsibility of saving the priesthood and its principles from the work of the compromisers. These faithful few shall redeem Zion, re-establish God's kingdom on the earth, and usher in the millennial reign of Christ. Asterisk 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 179 Addendum 1990 edition since the initial publication of this book, the LDS Church has continued to make further changes in the eternal and unchangeable laws and ordinances of the gospel. It is a paradox of religion that we contend against Catholicism for their apostasy because of changes they made in the gospel, yet the claim is made that under Mormonism, similar changes can be made with divine approval. The gospel may be added to by the addition of new light and understanding, but the moment we delete, change or oppose those principles, we lose that light. Herein lies the necessary obligation that every man must receive his own confirmation of the truth, for where there is a controversy, one must make a choice, and his eternal destiny may depend on his decisions and choices. The following three additional major changes, among others of somewhat lesser importance, have been made in the past few years. The format is the same as the 95 presented in the rest of this book and dash quoting first from scripture, then early LDS leaders, and comparing this consistent doctrinal position with present day teachings. 181. Negro and the Priesthood, 1978. Now, Pharaoh being of that lineage by which he could not have the right of priesthood, notwithstanding the Pharaohs would fain claim it from Noah, through Ham, therefore my father was led away by their idolatry. P of GP, Abraham 127, since Ham was a son of Noah, it is quite definite that he did not have a black skin, and was not a descendant of Cain. But the scripture seems to indicate that the wife of Ham was a descendant of Cain, and through her the curses were preserved, verses 21-25. Her name was Egyptus, which signifies that which is forbidden. Also, her daughter was known by the name of Egyptus, and Pharaoh was her grandson. He and his descendants could not hold the priesthood, verses 21, 25-27. P of GP Commentary, Milton R. Hunter, P. 141. I referred to the curse of Ham for laughing at Noah, while in his wine, but doing no harm. Noah was a righteous man, and yet he drank wine and became intoxicated. The Lord did not forsake him in consequence thereof, for he retained all the power of his priesthood, and when he was accused by Canaan, he cursed him by the priesthood which he held, and the Lord had respect to his word, and the priesthood which he held, notwithstanding he was drunk, and the curse remains upon the posterity of Canaan until the present day. Joseph Smith, D.H.C., 4, 445-446, 
Abraham Smoot inquiring of Joseph Smith what should be done with the Negroes in the South as I was preaching to them. Less than Joseph greater than said I could baptize them by the consent of their masters, but not to confer the priesthood upon them. L. John at all J. R. N. L. May the 31st 1879, shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If the white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty, under the law of God, is death on the spot. This will always be so. Brigham Young, J.D. 10, 110, 182. When all the rest of the children have received their blessings in the holy priesthood, then that curse will be removed from the seed of Cain. Brigham Young, J.D. 11, 272. Suppose we summons them LDS church leaders to appear here, and here declare that it is right to mingle our seed, with the black race of Cain, that they shall come in with us and be partakers with us of all the blessings God has given to us. On that very day and hour we should do so, the priesthood is taken from this church and kingdom and God leaves us to our fate. The moment we consent to mingle with the seed of Cain the church must go to destruction and dash we should receive the curse which has been placed upon the seed of Cain, and never more be numbered with the children of Adam who are heirs to the priesthood until that curse be removed. Brigham Young, 1854 State Legislature Talk Negroes in this life are denied the priesthood. Under no circumstances can they hold this delegation of authority from the Almighty. Bruce R. McConkie, Mormon Doctrine, P. 527, today. LDS Church extends priesthood to all worthy male members. All worthy male members of the church may be ordained to the priesthood without regard for race or color. Des. News, June 9, 1978, p. 1, 183, abolishment of the 70s, 1986, and the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the spirit which is upon thee, and will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. Mem. 11, 16-17. And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Luke 10 17, the seventy are also called to preach the gospel, and to be especial witnesses unto the Gentiles, and in all the world end dash thus differing from other officers in the church in the duties of their calling. And they form a quorum, equal in authority to that of the twelve special witnesses or apostles. D. Ampersand C. 107, 25-26. On the 28th of February, 1835, the Church and Council assembled, commenced selecting certain individuals to be seventies. To begin the organization of the first quorum of seventies, according to the visions and revelations which I have received. The seventies are to constitute traveling quorums, to go into all the earth, whithersoever the twelve apostles shall call them. DHC, 2, 202. One of the ordained offices in the Melchizedek priesthood is that of a seventy. Mormon Doctrine, Bruce R. McConkie, p. 707, 184, today. The office of the Seventy has been discontinued, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints announced Saturday. Asterisk, 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 a missionary-minded elder or high priest will be called as the state mission president with his counselors being selected from among the elders or high priests. SLC Tribune, p. 6A, October the 5th, 1986, 185, Temple Endowment Ceremony, 1990, the earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Isaiah 24, 5, asterisk, the order of the house of God has been, and ever will be, the same, even after Christ comes, and after the termination of the thousand years it will be the same. Joseph Smith, TPJS, P. 91, it signifies, then, that the ordinances must be kept in the very way God has appointed, otherwise their priesthood will prove a cursing instead of a blessing. TPJS, P. 169, 
Now taking it for granted that the scriptures say what they mean, and mean what they say, we have sufficient grounds to go on and prove from the Bible that the gospel has always been the same. The ordinance is to fulfill its requirements, the same, and the officers to officiate, the same, and the signs and fruits resulting from the promises, the same. TPJS, P. 264. Ordinances instituted in the heavens before the foundation of the world, in the priesthood, for the salvation of men, are not to be altered or changed. All must be saved on the same principles. TPJS, P. 308. The G. Rand key word was the first word Adam spoke and is a word of supplication. He, Joseph, found the word by the Urim and Thummim M. Dash it is that key word to which the heavens is sick opened. William Clayton Journal, June the 15th, 1844, asterisk asterisk, the church was undergoing internal deterioration, and was in a state of increasing perversion. Among the more detailed or specific causes of this ever widening departure from the spirit of the gospel of Christ, this 186 rapidly growing apostasy, the following may be considered as important examples, asterisk 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 2 unauthorized additions to the ceremonies of the church, and the introduction of vital changes in essential ordinances. James E. Talmage, The Great Apostasy, paperback 2nd ed. p. 71. No jot, iota, or tittle of the temple rites is otherwise than uplifting and sanctifying. In every detail the endowment ceremony contributes to covenants of morality of life, consecration of person to high ideals, devotion to truth, patriotism to nation, and allegiance to God. James E. Talmage, The House of the Lord, 1962, p. 100. Today because of, one, the church leader's desire to increase the diminishing temple attendance, two, persistent claims of offensiveness in parts of the ceremony, and, three, pressures by the feminist element in the church and dash many changes were made in the endowment ceremony, and the following excerpt appeared in an article printed nearly three weeks after the changes took effect in all LDS temples on April the 10th, 1990. LDS leaders revised temple endowment, Sacred ceremonies for the living and dead, performed by faithful Mormons within the walls of the church's temples have undergone what some view as their most significant changes this century. S.L. Tribune, April 29, 1990, p. 2b. Joseph Fielding Smith said that it is the Latter-day Saints who have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, and broken the everlasting covenant, because they were the only ones that had them to begin with. See this. News, Church Section, October the 17th, 1936. Asterisk, asterisk, a change was just made in the vocal expression of this name. 95 Theses by Ogden Kraut, if any man writes to you, or preaches to you, doctrines contrary to the Bible, the Book of Mormon, or the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, set him down as an imposter. N. Joseph Smith, Times and Seasons, April 1, 1844. When we have God's word pure and clear, then we think ourselves all right, we become negligent, and repose in a vain security. We no longer pay due heed, thinking it will always so remain, we do not watch and pray against the devil, who is ready to tear the divine word out of our hearts. No greater mischief can happen to a Christian people, than to have God's word taken from them, or falsified, so that they no longer have it pure and clear. God grant we and our descendants be not witnesses of such a calamity. N. Martin Luther, 7, Introduction. On October the 31st, 1517, Martin Luther posted 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Chapel in Germany. These propositions were an appeal for the more scholarly church members to discuss or debate them with Luther at the Wittenberg University. Luther's intent in writing the theses was not to condemn the church, nor to tell the Pope how it should be run but rather to evaluate the difference between Bible teachings and ever-increasing new innovations which were creeping into the doctrines of their faith. His writing was sparked by an authoritative change in doctrine and dash the Pope's sale of indulgences. Luther became aware of the discrepancy between the words of church leaders and the words of the Lord. There was also a contradiction between the teachings of one Pope to that of another. But the trend of making the people believe more in the ideologies of church leaders, than in the doctrines of the Bible, appeared to Luther as the greatest danger to their salvation. 
It is not out of reason to expect the Latter-day Saints to also evaluate today's doctrinal teachings by comparing them to the scriptures and revelations of the Lord. All of the general councils of the church have advised the members to search and study the scriptures. For example, the Savior urged us to search the scriptures, to find the way of life, John 5.39. Everyone owes it to himself to find Christ's truth, and finding it, to hold fast to it. Church News, May 4, 1974, p. 16. A similar and very timely article was written in 1965 as an editorial in the Church News. This article represents one of the finest literary masterpieces of ecclesiastical penmanship that has come from the present day leadership of the Church. It is not only accurate in its analysis of gospel principles, but emphasizes their eternal scope. It lets the reader envision the eternal nature of the promises and rewards which are attached to the everlasting principles of the gospel. It also challenges the reader to make comparisons of church doctrine with the scriptures. A major portion of the article read, 8. Our unchangeable deity. One of the most important things we may learn about our religion is that God is unchangeable, the same yesterday, today and forever. By this we may know that the principles of salvation will always remain the same, and that we need not be disturbed by new ideas or modern innovations in the gospel which may come our way. The gospel cannot possibly be changed. The heaven we hope to achieve is eternal and unchangeable. Therefore to bring the same human nature to the same goal, regardless of the time in which a person lives, requires the same steps and procedures. For that reason the saving principles must ever be the same. They can never change. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. To say that the gospel may be changed is to say that either God has changed, or that human nature is no longer human nature. It is obvious therefore that no one can change the gospel, and that if they attempt to do so, they only set up a man-made system which is not the gospel, but is merely a reflection of their own views. And since only God can save, only his gospel can save, and if we substitute any other gospel there is no salvation in it. Knowing as we do that man-made religion has no power to save, and realizing that we all have souls which require salvation, we should selfishly, and in our own best interests, make certain that we accept the right religion, God's religion, and not try to work our way into his kingdom by some man-made theory. Are the doctrines and rituals of the church in harmony with the Bible, or are they creations of men who end dash the well-meaning end dash have gone off on a tangent? If the principles by which any of us attempt to save ourselves are contrary to the Bible, we may know they are man's teachings, not God's, for the Lord and his gospel remain the same M dash always. Church News, June 5, 1965, p. 16. 9. This challenge and comparison applies to every person claiming to be a Christian. It is necessary for man to find out if their salvation is founded on a man-made system or that creations of men, even though they came from honorable and well-meaning men. The Church of Jesus Christ is not an exception. It should be able to stand comparative tests better than any other church. The following 95 theses contain only a sample of many such references on important principles and ordinances of the gospel. This compilation is written with the intent of making a comparison of the teachings in the Bible and Latter-day scriptures with those of present-day church leaders. There is also a comparison of present-day church teachings with those of former church leaders. However, the purpose of this book is not just to compare principles of the gospel as taught anciently to those in modern times. The main object is to better acquaint the reader with many of the principles which were taught both in the Bible and at the time of the Restoration, but which have gradually faded out of the realm of modern Christianity. If the principles by which we attempt to be saved are contrary to the Bible and the other scriptures, then we may know they are man's teachings, not God's, for the Lord and his gospel remain the same M- always. The everlasting principles and doctrines of the gospel should always remain the same, for surely a century should not make a difference in eternal principles. If it does, then we may know that something is wrong. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the only true church upon the face of the earth. Nevertheless, it too has its problems with a multitude of preachers who have arisen with heresies, conflicting doctrines, and vast assortment of opinions. Each Latter-day Saint should search the scriptures and determine what the Lord has said. 
It is only upon that rock that the gates of hell cannot prevail. 11. The word of God. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Isa. 48. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isa. 8. 20. To Nephi 18. 20. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed. Mark 8.38 he that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12:48. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Matt. 4, 4. For you shall live by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God. D. Ampersand C. 84, 44. Search these commandments, for they are true and faithful, and the prophecies and promises which are in them shall all be fulfilled. What I the Lord have spoken, I have spoken, and I excuse not myself, and though the heavens and the earth pass away, my word shall not pass away. D. Ampersand C. 137-38 Today Do the people of the church want a safe guide to what is well for them to do? It is this, keep in harmony with the presidency of this church. Accept and follow the teachings and advice of the President. Ensign, October 1972, 12, True Print. <clears throat> okay, so the book just started over and I let it go on for eight minutes into the beginning of the book. But if anybody wants to watch the beginning of the book, just go to 95 Thesis Part 1 in my videos. And uh, that's a black video with green text. I'm going to probably change that tomorrow and have it on this white format with black text because the autofocus goes crazy when the green text and the black background are on, even though that's the way I would prefer it. Anyway, but that's the end of the uh, book. And uh, the whole book itself is about... Oh, just a little under six hours long. So it's a long book, but there's lots of really interesting stuff in it. Lots of really good quotes. And uh, thank you everyone for watching it. And, uh, you know, if you feel inspired, share. And uh, you can also find this book to read for yourself at ogdenkraut.com. That's Ogden. O-D-G-E-N. Kraut is spelled K-R-A-U-T dot com. And that's all one word. And just go down to read Ogden's books. This particular book is called 95 Thesis, which is spelled out. And it's all in alphabetical order. So this is spelled out 95 let with the letters N-I-N. 95 Thesis. And uh, there's a lot of other books there that people can take a look at as well. And uh, I'll be making videos on those books as well. Um, it's faster for me just to do this and get the material out there than for me to read it because I comment too much on it. So um, I just decided to do this. Plus, since I work anywhere from like 11 to 14 hours a day, usually between 12 to 14, uh, I just don't really have the energy to do the radio programs or videos that I used to do, but I will continue to put out some. Anyway, uh, mostly it'll be these, uh, reading these, uh, using my iPad with this reader program and my iPhone to record it. So anyway, thank you everyone. Take care. God bless. Shalom.